And the only time that I ever knew my nephews and nieces to have any struggles or troubles was after they moved to Douglas County. Whether that had anything to do with it or not, I had this, this mentality about Douglas County. Then uh, years later, after I married and uh, we moved, guess where? Douglas County. And I found it to be true that methamphetamines, prior to that, the, the drug of choice was marijuana. And there's all, there's just, there was a lot of struggles and troubles out here in this very troubled county. We had a get tough program with our sheriff's office, and, uh, but it just seemed like the darkness pervaded. Well, as we uh, pastored and, and moved into Douglas County ourselves, I called an evangelist in to help me get into the high schools, and he, uh, he used to do a thing called Journey Through Rock. You remember Billy Mayo. And so we got into four high schools here in the county and then one in Cobb County. And, but at the end of that, after about 18 months of getting into high schools and working with teenagers, I was completely, totally bludgeoned. It is one of the hardest, mo it, but if, it were, if it's not uh, personal struggles that you have because of it, it's a direct warfare of, of the, the ministry. It's, it's the politics of trying to get into the school. And if it's not the politics of the school, it's the, it's the parents that come out and bring their kids. And if your persuasion is not exactly like theirs, you have pharisaical troubles just like Jesus had. I mean, by the time my teeth were kicked in, I thought, you know, these kids have got to be reached, but they're just going to have to be somebody other than a meek and quiet spirit like me to do it. Well, lo and behold, the prayers of the saints have prevailed, and we now have <clears throat> in this county, through the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, we have a, um, a man of God that God called. He's anointed for right now, and, and there are some historic things taking place in our county. And our complexion over all of our schools and all of, and from, from elementary school, middle school, high school, all of the spiritual complexion is changing. It was last year at this time that uh, our state rep, Micah Gravely, invited me out to a, a Faith and Freedom Coalition luncheon in downtown Atlanta and in, inside of the Capitol. And, and plopped down right beside me was a gentleman that I'd never met before. He uh, ran late because the guy he rode to the meeting with, his car broke down, and he didn't know how he was going to get home and come to find out he lived in Douglas County. So God had his ride waiting on him sitting at that table. We became friends instantly. I began to see immediately what God was calling him to do, and I was totally thrilled. And so to say no more, I want him to tell you all about it. Please welcome Mr. Dutch Nelson. <laughs> you I'm going to try to get set up here real quick, because um, I keep getting all these alerts, too. Mine are like Donald Trump stuff. The sucker <laughs> will not stop. <laughs> hey, I believe that uh, I read a book. You know, I found Christ in jail, and I read a book um, in there. I don't remember the name of it, but I remember it was by, the guy, by a guy by the name of Charles Stanley. And... I ended up, the first church that I ever went to, and I, yes, let me back up. I'm a hard man, but now I'm, a, I'm an emotional man nowadays, so I may, I may let it rip a couple of times. But I read this little part that said, God is the engineer of all friendships. He has the way of bringing the right people in your life at the right time for the right purpose. And I believe that day was one of those. I do. I ride with a pastor from this county car breaks down two miles from the Capitol. <laughs> and I said, well, I ain't, I'm not going to leave you. He said, just go. Two miles, <laughs> dressed like this. <laughs> I said, well, I need a ride back to Douglas County. I mean, crazy. I guess that's just one of those coincidences, right? <laughs> hey, I, I am going to talk in a minute about FCA, um, but I, I'm going to talk about how I got involved in FCA first. But just know this, there was an announcement made just a few months ago that FCA in Douglas County was the fastest growing, one of the fastest growing FCA counties in the United States of America. That's some big stuff, right? Amen? Um, thank you for all y'all have done. You know, you guys have been a blessing in my, in my wife and I's life, so give it up for Pastor John and Janie Alexander. <laughs> Give it up. I might have, um, I, I've been a little sick too for a few days and then I didn't get out of the hospital till I don't know, four o'clock this morning. But I'd already committed and I said, I'm going to be there. I called him last night, went straight to the hospital, I'm in the emergency room, and then on the way back from Reinhardt Bonnke, 
you know, pastor comes in and anoints oil on me and prays for me. I mean, not just everybody does that. Right? I mean, I don't know what time it was because I was in there for eight hours. But it was probably midnight or so, something like that. So uh, anyway, I'm grateful for that. But I wanted to share um, that, you know, God saved me from a life of craziness. Um, I've had a lot of ups and downs in my life. I know Mikey Barnhill almost my entire life. I've seen what he's done, seen where he's came from. He's seen my struggles. And, you know, he might not have been the one to put handcuffs on me, but one of his buddies have <laughs> several times. So, <clears throat> or maybe you did at some point. I don't know. Um, but my family and I have uh, agreed to support Mikey Barnhill as well. So, no, we're not going to get into all that, but I just figured I'd let you know. <laughs> we got three so far. <laughs> so, anyway, when I was a kid... Um, you, you, know, you know how you go through life, and you look back, and then you went, oh, I get it now. But it takes some experience to be able to realize it. Well, it, it comes to me to, to, to see how important that a kid's parents are. You know, they've got some young kids, I saw, right? And, and I'm not the greatest at everything, and, you know, thank goodness for for that song that I heard earlier about being forgiven. And, you know, thank goodness for that. But, you know, I never really understood what relationships were. I never understood what love was. I, I didn't really grow up in a church. We went to a Mormon church. I ended up going playing football at a Mormon college. My dad still says he's Mormon. You know, I say, you're crazy. But anyway, I've never seen my parents. My mom has passed three years ago this month, but I've never seen my parents hold hands in my entire life, ever. I've never seen him open a door for her. I've never seen him sleep in the same bedroom, ever. And it's crazy because we just bought the house I grew up in, you know. So it's pretty amazing being back in that place. We've, we've got to remodel it. But the reason I talk about this and I kind of go back to that era is because I realized that Things were developing in my life at a young age. You know, maybe even, even back to when I was seven years old. You see that. I mean, I was a fighter. I fought all the time. I was in fights. You know, relationships as you get older fail, you know. And I remember, um, you know, when I met my wife, I've been through a few of those. But... Um, <laughs> I said, one of the things I'm not ever going to do is get married again because I'm not good at it. I'm absolutely awful at it. And, uh, and, and to come back, you know, I look, I do think that part of that childhood is part of that, too. Learning, you know, the guidance from the man and, 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 and all that stuff as well. Um, but I'm going to share with you kind of like an overview of my life from the time of, uh, you know, a troubled kid. You know, through athletics and in my life, being pretty successful in athletics, thinking I was playing in the pros, but didn't make it. You know, married into a lot of wealth, um, lived a life of a lot of, lot of money for many years, fair, drug addiction, jail, a lot of prison time, redemption. And, um, and that's where I am now. So... Part of when I told you that you find stuff out later in your life of something that happened earlier in your life, I went to see Donald Trump again. <laughs> Golly, that guy won't give up. <laughs> um, I, in 2001, and I'm going to bounce around a little bit, I was diagnosed a sociopath. And, uh, you know, I was on all kind of medications for 10 years. When I got saved, I haven't been on one since. But anyway, yeah, amen. But the guy diagnoses me as a sociopath. And I said, I didn't have a college education. I have, a, I have some degrees now. But at the time, I was like, what is that? That sounds like a killer. <laughs> he said, well, as a matter of fact, <laughs> most serial killers are sociopaths. <laughs> and I said, well, you know what? I really don't want to be that. Um, 
You can give me another pill. Make it pill number six. So anyway, that goes back to my childhood to where they told me, these doctors told me, it's a, you know, it's, it's someone that's incapable of love. Someone with violent behavior. Someone that abuses animals, could be. It's typical traits of a serial killer, all that. And I said, well, I don't want, how did I, how did I become that? And he said, it's typically developed in your childhood. And there is no fix. There is no cure. There's just absolutely no cure of sociopathic behavior. Now, I learned that later in my life, which, which explains a lot of my middle school years and high school years and the fighting and my temper and my behavior. Y'all follow me? Yep. So I ended up, luckily, I was gifted in sports. Um, Played, played football, baseball, a lot of different sports in my life, even into my adult life, acting like I was a kid still. But I was pretty good. I was a quarterback at Alexander High School. I had a lot of scholarships. I did a verbal to play at Auburn, which I rolled with the tide. I don't know what I was thinking. And uh, so you're talking, um, did a verbal with them, came up my senior year, ended up going to BYU. My dad's a Mormon. Didn't really grow up in the Mormon church, but that's his belief. And uh, next thing you know, I'm at a Mormon school. And they said that I was the craziest guy there since Jim McMahon. <laughs> Beat it. Now, I ended up leaving in a very, very short period of time. Went to West Georgia College, co called up Coach Mac McWhorter, who has been a very successful coach um, in that college film, I mean, college realm of football. And I said, hey, can I come play for you? Can I still get that scholarship? Because, you know, we were already two weeks into fall training football. He said, I'll tell you what, come on in, and uh, we'll talk. So I got into admissions, did my whole thing, walked into the uh, locker room, and they do depth charts in, in locker rooms. And for you that don't know what that is, every position has a depth chart, and it tells you where you stand on it. And when you're number one, that means you're starting. And I was number nine. Number nine at West Georgia? Are you out of your mind? You know, because I, I was pretty cocky about it. I was pretty arrogant. And, uh, you know, within a, a few days, I was number two. And I said, you're dang right. Well, the problem was <clears throat> there was this girl from this county who I had had a crush on since I was like 12 years old that went to West Georgia. And it's, it's not funny, but to see... My passion for the game of football changed literally overnight for this girl. I lost that passion of football. You know, the passion of football is what kind of kept me out of uh, trouble in high school. I wasn't into drugs. I, I didn't cuss. I didn't drink. I wasn't a Christian. If you said, do you believe in God, I'd said yes. Um, I was into football. You know, I had a girlfriend, but I, d I didn't go out with guys. I just didn't really get that much trouble or, or any of that. The fighting subsided a little bit. Um, it was right when I graduated high school and went to college. That's, that's when I went <laughs> and was on my uh, crash landing course um, that lasted for many, many years. In college, how do you go to college? for four quarters, now they're semesters. How do you go to college for four quarters and you don't get a single credit hour? <laughs> That's almost impossible, isn't it? I went there for four quarters and they finally told me to beat it, beat it. But I had already quit the football team. And I walked in and it's for some reason, I still remember this to this day, that I walked in to Coach Mike McWhorter and said, Coach, I quit. Now, you know when you, you, you play in high school, you're, you're at one level. When you get to college, everybody is just as good as you are. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I wasn't the stud at West Georgia. You know, I was one of the top ones, but I wasn't the outstanding stud that stood out from everybody else. And he just looked at me, and he goes, he didn't say a word. And I, I got up and left. I started partying with this girl. I was hooked on her just like dope. 
I didn't care about anything else, and that's when I got into the party scene and into Atlanta, 18 years old, partying in clubs. Yeah, I got it very, very, very involved in drugs and drug dealing and drug trafficking and trying to hide from Mikey Barnhill. And, uh, and, and these cops chasing me all over the place, you know, for like two years, the 89, 90, 91 era, and just acting like a fool. Got, got addicted to drugs, got into a little bit of trouble, pleaded first offender, scared to death when I was 20, I don't know, 21, 22, just scared to death. Kept me clean for a long time, 17 years. You know, I had felony uh, stuff that could happen, but I pleaded the first offender, so everything ended up going away anyway. Y'all follow me? Uh, so just by sheer scared to death alone kept me clean. I was on intense probation, staying at my parents' house. Well, guess what I had to do? I had to go get a job. I'm 22 years old. And I never had a job. Well, I did deliver pizza at Primo's. Primo's Pizza, but I think when I was 16, 17. But I had to go get a job. I never had a job because I, I sold dope. And... Uh, I didn't like that part. You know, walking in to a warehouse off Six Flags and knocked on the door. Let me see where I am. Knocked on the door, and the guy comes up, and I said, hey, I need a job. And he said, where's your resume? What's that? I didn't even know what a resume was. At 22 years old, I didn't even know what a resume was. Sat down with him. He gave me the opportunity to have a short interview with him. And I said, sir, I don't have an interview. I've never had a job, and, um, but I know I need one. And if you give me the job, I'm confident that whatever it is y'all doing here, what, is y'all, what do y'all do? He said, we pick parts, and we ship them to dealerships. It's Kia Motors America. I said, I'm confident that if you'll give me a shot at it, I'll be your number one parts picker in three months. And he said, no. It's impossible. It'll take you a year to learn this. I said, all right, one month. One month. Well, that guy ended up hiring me at, you know, whatever it was, eight, nine bucks an hour. He ended up becoming my um, business mentor. And we all have mentors in our life at some level, you know. That's why I love hanging out with older men, because they got something I want. (laughs) They got something I want. They'll ask, people ask me, why do I see you and Shay out in public with older people? Sometimes in their 70s, because they got what we want. I'm a knucklehead, I'm hard-headed, but I at least know that part. (laughs) I'm going to figure it out eventually. So this guy ends up becoming my business mentor. I get married, had two kids right off the bat. I mean, they're 16 and 19 right now. Um, married and divorced kind of real quick, all within just a few years. Well, I worked my way up with this business mentor through this corporate world, made it to a supervisor, made it to a senior supervisor, made it to a manager. Next thing you know, I'm the Southeast Regional Manager making six-figure income, all in five years. And I was making good money, and I just kept working my way up, working my way up. Now I'm making you know, 150 a year. And I was like, I don't even have a college degree. I told y'all you don't need one of those. (laughs) I met this girl right after I got divorced. She thinks the reason why was because she was rich, which was probably why. I'm not sure, probably so. She was rich, and her dad was worth hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and I could keep going with a bunch of those, of millions of dollars. My whole life, I wanted to be an NFL football player. Anybody ever wanted to be something that they didn't, get, they didn't make it to where they thought they were going to make it? I did end up playing semi-pro for two years out in Villarica with a bunch of convicts <laughs> and guys that didn't make it in the NFL, and I got absolutely destroyed. I did good, but I got hurt. I get a, uh, Stacy Danley 
Some of y'all, I know Mikey knows Stacy Daly. He was a successful, very successful running back at Douglas County High School. Played for Auburn. I think started maybe all four years. Um, he got me a shot to go on at the Falcons. Practice squad. Not the Falcons. The practice squad that the Falcons play against. I got destroyed. <laughs> all in five days. <laughs> Five days, they said, this is not for you. And I said, I agree. <laughs> this is not for me. I'm bowing out. So now, my goals have changed in life at the age of 25, 26. You know, that's how I started working with that business mentor, working my way up through the business world. And I said, okay, well now, my goal from being an NFL quarterback has now changed. I want to be a successful multimillionaire. That's what I want to be. Well, I'll never do that where I was with Kia Motors America. I mean, in the corporate side of things, it was the parts, uh, parts and service division, uh, servicing uh, dealerships all over the southeastern United States. But I made, a, I made a good amount of money, especially still being in my 20s. Well, right when I met that girl and found out she was a gazillionaire, <laughs> or her daddy was, going to get married? It was pretty quick. It was pretty quick. And we got married, I think, within a year after I got divorced. Maybe less than that, to be honest. Um, so next thing you know, I got married to her. We're, um, I'm, in, I'm in the um, second marriage. And you know how I said now my... My, my desires and my goals have changed, so well, now I just found it. I mean, I went, whoa, I just won the lottery. <laughs> I don't play the lottery, never have, probably never will. It's just not my thing. But, um, but I married it. <laughs> I married the lottery. Her dad owned a bunch, a bunch of businesses, and, you know, then, then I'm getting in good with their family, and she had some brothers that had some companies that were very, very successful. Well, now I'm interested in, in uh, the next level of leadership, corporate leadership. <clears throat> I'm starting to meet with CEOs and presidents and vice presidents and work on this thing that we call a resume. <laughs> and they helped me put together a really good one. And I spent a couple of years with these guys. And I started learning that whole um, corporate life. And I got pretty, pretty good at it. Well, in 2004, um, I was the Southeast Regional Manager, Interim Director for North America. I held that role for two years. And at the last second, I called him up out in California and said, you promised me that job. I have the number one center in America. You promised me that job. Sorry, we gave it to a guy from Toyota. I said, didn't you come from Toyota? All right. I was upset. I was hurt. I put all my effort, all my passion, and everything that I desired into that job. Uh, I think some of y'all might can relate to that. Um, when I uh, found out, I called my ex-wife, and I told her what had just happened. And she said, give me a second. I'll call you right back. She called me back. She says, I got an offer for you from my mother. My mom will pay your salary, which was very big then, even more than what I had been making. I had a free car because I worked for a car company and I was at a level of management to where they gave it to me. I had free gas, you know, I had insurance. She said, I, she believes that you did not get that position because you didn't have an education. She's going to pay for your salary, pay for you a new car, pay for you, give you $6,000 a month and pay for your college education. And I tell people that because that's a mighty offer. Is it not? Yeah. What an offer. I still didn't want to do it because my heart was in the corporate world, but I did. I quit, went back to school. My ex-father-in-law owned AIU, American Intercontinental University. All, everyone in the world. So 
I was originally started off going to the Dunwoody campus, switched, went to uh, Georgia State University, and finished up at um, University of Phoenix. In 2007, I finally had my business degree. But what had happened in 2004, right when I quit the corporate world, I went to full-time college for, to get my business degree. My brother-in-law, ex-brother-in-law, approaches me and said, let's start up this business. I said, I just started full-time school. So next thing you know, we start up a business, became very successful. Him and his dad get in a big fight. He buys him out. We become partners. We run this successful company, and it is going very, very well. We did art shows. We went into schools and had children do artwork, and we framed it, put it in a gallery-style art show, and we sold it back to the school, and it became a fundraiser for the school. We were in 1,800 schools in the southeast. Every ele elementary school level. Ended up becoming very successful. Had a, about 120 employees. Grew to a several million dollar business. Well, do you remember me telling you that I had been married before and I had two kids? So when I'm married to the rich girl now, I got everything in her name, so she, the first wife doesn't get it all. Which I thought was a smooth move for a while. Uh, 2009, y'all remember the market started going down when 07, 08, and we, you know, you put these P and L's together and, and together in these budgets, and you look at them and you see, oh my gosh, we're starting to lose money. You know, it's people are not buying art frames anymore; they're just not doing it. So we ended up selling the company, but it was in her name. Bottom line is, I didn't really have much. I was married into a lot, but in my name, I really didn't have much. 2008 and 9, I became very bored. I already made several hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. When her dad took AIU uh, public and sold it to SECO, every kid got several, several, several million dollars. I don't need to do anything anymore. I got everything I want. I've been everywhere I want. He's got the yachts and the jets. They weren't mine, but I had access to them. And I'm not sure if any of you guys can relate to that. And I tell this story for a reason. Yes, it was fun. Yes, I was cocky about it then. But I tell it for a reason because I know there was a purpose of why I went through all that. To show me that money's not going to make it. Have you ever heard, and I prob I'm probably correct that... Maybe each and every one of us in this room at some point in your life has said, I wish I could go back to that time. You know where I want to go back to? Right now. I'm already here. I don't want to go back to any part of my life except for where I am right now. I'm the happiest I've ever been. So I tell these stories for a reason because if you look at the history of my life as a child, um, whether it was grades or fighting or girls or partying or dope or drug addiction, even money, nothing could make me happy. It made me happy, but as time progressed, the, the length of happiness got shorter and shorter. And you know, you know how you hear about drug addicts? how they'll get hooked on dope, and then they got to do more and more to stay on the high, and then the high lasts a lot less, and they got to do it more. It was kind of like that. The way I always refer to it to, for people that have never understood drug addiction is, what do you do when you get hungry? You eat. And then what happens literally just hours later? And then you, I mean, you can't even be satisfied by food. But for a short period of time, so the, even money, being married to a multi-multi-millionaire, you would think that I would be happy. 2009 National Championship team, Alabama, Crimson Tide, Roll Tide. <laughs> <coughs> I had this big old nice theater basement, and my dad's down there with me, and he goes, you're not happy. Have you not seen what I got here? He said, you're not happy. Watching the Bama game. When I'm watching the Bama game, everybody knows I'm in the room. But I knew that I was not happy. 
I tried several things, several, several, several things to try to find that next <clears throat> to make me happy. I knew I was missing something. As a matter of fact, in 09, and then I got into bodybuilding. Got into bodybuilding, bunch of steroids. You know, I, well, let me, I'm going to back up just a little bit. I got into competitive paintball <laughs> as a 35-year-old man and traveled the country with 20-year-olds playing competitive paintball because I could. I could buy my friends. Big fight last night in Vegas. I could call up my buddies and say, we're all going all on me because I could. I got into competitive uh, downhill snow skiing for a little bit in Colorado, in Salt Lake City. I got into bodybuilding. If you see, there's a pattern here. I get involved, I lose interest, I find something else. I get involved. This relationship that I've had a little over five years with Jesus is the longest thing that I've ever had in my life. <laughs> Amen. Yes, my ex-wife, the rich lady, said this too will come and go within six months. She would often ask me, what is it going to be next? I couldn't be happy. We were really good roommates. We weren't a good husband and wife. But I knew something was wrong. I was already visiting churches. I was having an affair from one of those places men shouldn't be going to. I was having an affair, but I was still bouncing into these different churches. And I lived up in Dunwoody because I knew I was missing something. I'd take my kids, you know, I'd come to Douglasville, pick them up, take them. I'd take them to a couple of churches. And I just knew, let's see where I'm on time. Um, I just knew that I was missing something. Something is not right. I've had different times in my life where people shared the gospel with me, in in one ear, out the other. But, you know, if someone says, hey, do you believe in Jesus? I could be doing dope at that moment. High, blow smoke out. Said, of course. <laughs> you know, there's a difference. <laughs> Satan believes Jesus. <laughs> He knows who Jesus is. He already knows the power that he has. So when I hear that, and I don't want people to get misconstrued on that. I hope y'all get what I'm saying. When you say you believe in Jesus, and Satan believes in Jesus, I think there's something else more to it. You know, building that relationship with Jesus. So I'm not, uh, I'm not anointed like him, or a Reinhardt Bonnke, or a Billy Graham, or a pastor. Um, you know, I have a different anointing. The day I pulled up in Dunwoody at that house, in this big old house, and I honked the horn, and I revved the engine of this 2010 Ferrari, and I called her to come out, and she came out, and she looked at me, and she slammed the door and went inside. I knew I might be out of control. I went and bought... $285,000 car and didn't even talk to my wife about it. You know, if I buy a $50 pair of shoes, I go and talk to her about it first. <laughs> hey, I'm buying these shoes, or just a little, I'm letting you know. I realized that my, my life was out of control. I realized that I was on a spiral downhill. I've got an affair, I'm having an affair, and nothing's making me happy. July. 14th, 2010, I remember the date very well. For one, it was traumatic date. And my mom, um, what birthday was that day. My ex-wife called me up and said, you need to come home right now. The dog's dead. That was my dog. I take off, fly in, pull in the driveway. Her entire family's there. What the crap? And I open up the door. There's my dog. The dad... He's a successful businessman, but he's also got to where he was because, you know, he's, a, he's not the most political correct guy either. He said, sit down. Yes, sir. So when this guy told you to do something, you, yes, sir. And he hands me this book, and I open this book. It was a portfolio, a binder. And I take this, and I open it up, and the first thing there was 
Guess what it was? <laughs> Prenup that I signed 10 years previous. I went, uh-oh. They know. I was the idiot. They had known for six of the nine months that I was having the affair. So every time I'd go to a family function or hang out on a Sunday, they already knew. They had pictures, they had evidence, they had tracking device, they had, I mean, it was crazy. I wanted to flee. Maybe no one can understand that affair part, but anybody ever wanted to run <laughs> from, or flee from something they caused their self? I was scared to death. I was humiliated, and I wanted out of there as fast as I could possibly get out of there. I ran up, got enough stuff to cover me for a few days, drove down Roswell Road, pulled into a parking lot. I had two, I had two cars. He let me have the BMW. Beat it. We'll load up everything else. You give me an address, we'll tell you where we'll ship, we'll ship it to. Gave me a satchel full of cash and said, this is all you get. Beat it, sign it, sign it. You know, it was crazy. Well, I'm sitting in that parking lot and I'm going, where did my life go wrong? And you, you start and you, and you go back to your childhood and you kind of, you know, you, you take a little uh, bird's eye view of the history of your life and went, did it all wrong. You know, even the way, you know, my sister, she graduates 4.0 from high school. She's got her graduate degree, I mean her uh, business uh, undergrad at 21. She ends up getting her master's, then her specials, and her doctorate by 25. She's the youngest principal in the United States of America at 29. And then at 39 or 40, she's a state superintendent of education in Montana. And I go, I'm the black sheep. Yeah, right. So my uncle says, you took over for me, thank you. So you, you look at the way she handled things. You know, I, I look at the, you know, how long have you been with the Sheriff's Department? That's pretty consistent. Yeah. How long have you been in the ministry? Church. Yep, but you've been in ministry for decades. I've been in in something two years, I've been in something three months, I've been in something six months. I've never had consistency in my life. The longest thing that did last was my passion for money because I could do what I want whenever I wanted it. I would drive back to this county because my kids lived here and I would go up to various businesses just so they'd see the car I drove. Well, I got slapped right up against the face with a humble stick really quick. <laughs> I threw my hands in the air in defeat I like sticking a, an ostrich sticking his head in the sand. I said, the heck with it. And I don't know if any of you in here can relate to that and say, you know what? I don't care anymore. I don't know if you've ever been at a point in your life like that as well, but I did. That was me. And I went and I hung out in strip clubs and I did a lot of dope again. Picked up where I left off 17 years later. Got hooked on cocaine and crack cocaine. And within three months, and I could be off a little bit. This is in mid-2010. My dates could be off a little bit. Within about three or four months, I went through tens of thousands of dollars, accumulated 36 felonies, three different counties, facing 10 years prison time. <laughs> three months, I went from 22 million to losing all that money, to 36 felonies, two, three counties, 10 years prison time. Come on now, give me a hand. <laughs> I'm an idiot. <laughs> Golly. I think that was over a course of about six months because December 7th, and I think that's a D-Day. December 7th is a D-Day. Pearl Harbor, 1941. Well, December 7, 2010, I was in detox and medical. I didn't wake up for three days. I tried to kill myself. I had a gun, gotten a lot of, it's a lot of, I tried to kill myself by overdose. I was too chicken to do that. 
My daughter sent me a message on my phone. I wished I really still had it to this day. Um, just to kind of just keep me in, just so I could hear it again. She was 13. And she cried. And she said, please go turn yourself in. I had an almost a beat up a drug dealer, didn't know if he was going to live. That's where I got the gun. I wanted to die. I don't want to live anymore. But I was too chicken to go do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Wake up three days later, they put me in gym pop, and I'm in Cherokee County Jail. I was on December 10th. Every Thursday, they had chapel. This guy named Bart Sims, short, big, round, Humpty Dumpty guy. <laughs> He's one of my Christian mentors to this day. He shared the gospel. You remember, it's, 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 it's Christmas. And so that's baby Jesus. And he comes in there. And this was on December 12th, on Thursday. And he's got foam coming out of his mouth. And he's going, Jeez! I said, Jeez! And I said, I made a quick exit. I said, I ain't doing that. I had already befriended some guys in there, a couple of guards. And they said, we've already talked about it. We know that you're missing Jesus in your life. I said, I know. I'm studying. I'm reading this Bible. You know, I'm trying to, I'm praying. The guard came up and said, for the next seven days, I want you to pray 30 times a day for peace and understanding. For the next time you go in there, the next Thursday. And I went in there, and you got to figure, remember I told you that I've been um, diagnosed as sociopath? Well, they don't cry either. I've never cried a day in my life, not over happiness, not over sadness, not over pain, not over joy, not over having kids born. I'm not saying I didn't have emotion, I just didn't generate tears. I had eye surgery in 2002, corrective eye surgery, and the doctor said, something is wrong with your, eye, your eyes. You can't generate tears. Mm, maybe it's because I'm a sociopath. <laughs> The first thing that I had remembered when I woke up out of gym pop, I mean out of medical, was I, I need my pills. I've been on medication, five medications for 10 years, and I'm not talking about heartburn, which I'm suffering with now. You know, I'm talking about antidepressant, all that stuff. And I'm not saying it's not needed, but do I think it's abused in the United States of America? Absolutely. December 18th, 2010, I went in there with an open heart. And he shared the gospel with me, and um, I cried. I cried my eyeballs out. I don't even remember what he said. To this day, I really don't know what he said. I cried like a baby because I had the day before I laid down on however thick that concrete is. Barnhill would know. I don't know. It's deep. <laughs> and I laid on there, and I said, please save me from this life of craziness. I do think you're real. I do. I do believe in you. And I, I don't have a relationship with you. Please save me from this life of craziness. And I cried what I remember my first tears ever being. And I couldn't quit, and it was uncontrollable, and I could not quit. And I told Bart Sims, I said, he's the chaplain. He's still the chaplain. And I said, he got to come see me get baptized by Andy Stanley. Not by Andy Stanley, but Andy Stanley's church. And I said, he softened my heart. I think my heart's soft. He said, he didn't soften your heart. He gave you a new one. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, you know, Ezekiel 36, 26, that I will give you a new heart. So I had this, uh, you know, I'm in trouble in Cherokee, Douglas County, Atlanta. And I've got charges everywhere. I'm done. Ten years prison time. I end up spending two months in jail. And everything went away from 36 felonies to uh, 10 years prison time. 36 felonies, 10 year prison time to one misdemeanor. Um, what did I get? A year of probation? I'm gonna share this story with you. The first place that I go to when I get out, well, you know, I had to do my little bail stench too, to go from Cherokee to Douglas County, and I had my bail bonding buddies that got me out of all of them. Thank goodness for them. And uh, Douglas County wasn't fun either. Cherokee was a boot camp. It was easy. 
Douglas County was not fun. Rice Street in Atlanta? Oh, my gosh. I got in three fights in six hours. And they were defending my life. So I'm, I'm finally out, which I do need to back up. I found out the time that I was going to get out, roughly. And I said, okay, well, that's 30 days. The Bible is 1,800 pages long, divided by 30. Well, this is how many I need to read a day. And I'll be done in 30 days. So I decided I'm going to read the Bible in 30 days. I didn't retain much of it. Never read it before in my life. But I read that sucker in 30 days because, you know, when you're in jail, you've got a whole lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I had lost a bunch of weight, gain, trying to gain some weight back. I finally get out. I go to court, the Fulton County Drug Court, and they say, do you want to go through the Fulton County Drug Court program? You have, whatever, uh, 18 felonies. And I said, what is that? And they, you know, it's like two years. And you could tell you, it's, and this sucker's intense. It's like five hours a day, five days a week for three months, four hours a day, four days a week for three months. You can't even hold a job. I said, no, I'm not doing that. He goes, okay, three years prison time. Then today, I was, whoa, whoa, I'll do it. I ended up doing very, very well in it. Somehow, some way, um, I ended up in seminary <laughs> to get my master's. I mean, I'm like three, four months clean. I mean, out, out clean. Not in clean, but out clean. And I'm in seminary. I don't even know how I got in. I don't even remember applying. <laughs> and it's crazy. You know, and at the same time, I got court dates that I'm trying to fix because I'm about to go back to prison. So why am I going to seminary if I know I'm about to go back to prison? I didn't want to get involved in any relationships, long-term relationships. So um, Fulton County, to sum that one up, two-year program. They came to me in nine months and said, you have been a model student. You have never had one single um, infraction. You haven't had one dirty urine test. You're teaching a health and fitness class here. We're going to graduate you next month. So I spent 10 months in that program, graduated. All my stuff was done. Cherokee County was during that time as well. Bart Sims would keep going up to me. I'd already made a deal with the DA and uh, to do three years. There's already a deal. Done deal. Bart Sims prayed for me in the parking lot. You know what? I'm a baby Christian. I'm not a big prayer. I'm a, I'm a 10 second prayer. <laughs> Maybe five. He's an hour prayer. Pray, prayer. I'm like, oh my God. I mean, I'm about to fall down. I said, Can I at least sit down? <laughs> so we're in the parking lot, Cherokee County Jail, I mean, at courthouse. And, you know, I keep doing this, I'm trying to see who's watching us. And he prays for me for an hour. He said, God will, I mean, will guide the king's heart, being the judge, like a water course. God will guide the, the king's heart like a water course. I said, you're out of your mind. I'm going to jail today. My aunt is my power of attorney. We sit in there from 9 o'clock in the morning to 5 o'clock in the afternoon. God will guide the king's heart like a water course. God will guide the king's heart like a water course. God will guide the I'm not kidding you. Well, they don't call my name at lunchtime. We go eat, we come back. God will guide the king's heart like a water course. God will guide the Hush. <laughs> the judge comes out, gets up, and then leaves again. A lady comes back, what seemed like an eternity later, and uh, said, the judge is sick. He's not coming back. So you can either reschedule with him or you can maybe get your shot next door with another attorney. So my judge, I mean my attorney, grabbed me and said, let's go try the other guy. They did their case, we did our case. He gets up and walks out. What is going on? He comes back and he says, Mr. Nelson, I understand how well you're doing with the Fulton County Drug Court Program. Do you know that I implemented the Fulton County Drug Court Program in 1999? Hmm. I just called Director Larry and he vouched for you. I think you got sideways, but I think you're on the right track. Dismissed. Wow.
Hey, Amen. <laughs> I don't ever tell that story, these judges' stories, do much. Um, she told me about it six months ago. You need to tell that story. I just always skip over that. I just, but you know, people are like, well, how do you get out of 36 families? <laughs> so now, I meet Shay. I live in Roswell with my aunt, trying to get back on my feet. She lives in this county, which I made a, a life commitment never to come back to. <laughs> also made another life commitment not to ruin another woman's life and get married. She hits me up on Facebook. We go back and forth a couple of times, and I find out she lives in Douglas County. I said, do you know me? She went, nope. I went, how do you not know me? <laughs> you live in Douglas County, and you don't know me. <laughs> so she drives all the way up to Alpharetta, North Point Mall. We go to watch a horrible movie I picked. And we get out of the car. and said, I need to tell you a few things real quick. <laughs> and she said, what's that? We go out on this date, and you tell somebody, you're going to hear one of a few things. He was an athlete that turned into a drug, a drug addict, that, a cocky, rich guy, and, uh, oh, he's a minister now. You know, it was a short period of time. So I just wanted you to be up front. She went, okay. Well, I still had Douglas County pending. I went to court. With the with the with the judge, I mean, with the lawyer that took care of Fulton County and Cherokee County. When he came here, I had a can't remember the judge's name, not Bo, but the other guy. And I go up there, and boy, he was mattering a hornet at me. I'd already, but then it got pushed off. Rachel Ackley, the, she was one of the assistant DAs or whatever. Three years prison time banished me from this county for life. I said, my kids live here. Banished me from the county for life. And um, three years prison time. Judge didn't like it. Matter of fact, I just made my amends with that judge on the lawn at Heritage Baptist Church about six months ago. Wow. What was his name? Judge Emerson. Is that not amazing? I said, do you know me? He said, no, I don't. I said, I'm Dutch Nelson. You, you gave me a second chance. Actually, you probably gave me about 15 of them. And uh, so I got to make my amends with the judge. The judge did not want to accept the three-year deal. He wanted 10. Um, but go back to the calendar, and we'll do this again. My lawyer says, I don't know this guy. You need a lawyer from this county. There's a guy named Dusty Hightower, who's a state house rep, who I kept seeing eye me the whole time. And he ended up coming over and he said, I know that judge very well. I ended up hiring him as my attorney. Three months go by, call Dusty up, court date's pushed off again. Three months go by, court date's it gets pushed off. Well, at some point, you just want the thing to be over. Yeah. All right, I'll do the 10 years. I mean, I'm done. Not really, but y'all follow me. Yeah. So it ended up getting pushed off for a year and a half. By this time, I'm already in the ministry. I mean, I was in ministry speaking at FCA events at five and six months clean. That's crazy. Yeah. Because if they had asked me, how clean are you? In six months, you know what society would put the twist on it, right? So, next thing you know, it's a year and a half later. I'm engaged to her. You know, and I got a county officials like the, uh, the sheriff and uh, Womack, who used to be the chief, and some other city officials and Matthew Kroll, Solicitor General. And by this time, Brian Fortner's on my side. And he's the DA. It's crazy. So I go in that morning. I don't remember what it was, what day. It's like 2012, year and a half later, two years later. And I'm in the courtroom, and I'm like, I'm going away. And Rachel Ackley says, Your Honor, um, I went to Dusty Hightower the day before, and I said, I've paid my dues. I've paid my dues. Go talk to Rachel Ackley. Pay all your court cases and put them to the side for eight hours and concentrate on it. 
I walked in and Rachel Agnes said, Your Honor, yesterday I received seven phone calls from uh, elected county officials in Mr. Nelson's behalf. He's already in our school system speaking in schools, and if he gets convicted, he won't be able to do it anymore. You know, when you turn around and all these county officials are in there, the bottom line is he ended up letting it go, and he gave me a misdemeanor. I think that's what it was. One misdemeanor and a year of probation. And if that would not have happened, could you see where my life might be right now? I would still be in prison. I do a lot of prison ministry as well. Shay and I do some prison ministry, and I get to go, and we get to share in these prisons all over. And I just look and go, that was me. But God saved me from a life of craziness. And I look at it and just go, where, where in the world would I be? I'm medication free. I'm, I'm, I'm a newbie, newbie, newbie Christian. I can cry. And she loves it. I can't say I did. And I just look at what God's done to my life, and I'm happy, and I don't make a lot of money. I mean, I wouldn't mind making a little bit more. But um, it's just amazing what God's done in, in our lives. You know, and now I, I live in the house that I grew up in. And, uh, you know, we talk about FCA, because I, I might as well talk about that. I did get my seminary degree, uh, my master's in Christian ministries and uh, pastoral um, whatever that fancy word is, in two th May of 2013. So I got that. That was another achievement. Um, you know, till I pay that bill off. We're not even talking about a mat I mean, a doctorate. Um, but I, I sit there and think about how in the world did I get into the ministry? Every single thing that I've ever done in my life, I've went out, searched for it applied, interviewed, and proved myself. I have spoken in five years now. I have spoken in over, three, uh, over 350 places, whether it was in a church, whether it was in a school, whether it was in a prison, whether it was in a jail. All the different prisons that I've done, I have never applied to nothing. <laughs> hey, can I come speak there? Never. It just happened. I've always wondered what it meant to be called. How do you know? Well, Eric Helms told me you will know when you know, when you know, when you know. And I believe that God called me to ministry in prison. Nobody else that's not, that's not a Christian can understand that or fathom it. And I was doing part-time FCA stuff for a long time, but I had to work and get a job, and I remember calling her the day, and I'm making pretty good money again. Hey, I just want to let you know I'm going into full-time ministry. She said, okay, okay. You know, we went from a salary that looked like this to a salary that, you know, doesn't last a month within an entire year. Um, Y'all have that FCA stuff? So next thing you know, I'm doing, doing full-time ministry with FCA. They moved me to Douglas County, to the school system in Douglas County, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, just to let you know um, the next slide. And I got this up just to give, because uh, I'm a visual kind of guy, and I think it kind of gives you a kind of an idea of where we stand, because you know, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes isn't just for Christian, I mean, just for athletes. Right. It's for everybody. Alexander High School has the largest FCA student huddle in the United States of America right now. Amen. They have coaches. They have athletes. They have teachers. They have staff. They have administration. They have kids. They have parents. They have cops. They have churches showing up at this huddle. It's absolutely amazing. Um, these are just some statistics of how, you know, what we, how many we reach, that's more um, from a national standpoint. You can hit the next slide. Read that. Well, there, we'll hit that right there. The vision for the FCA is to see the world impacted for Christ through the influence of athletes and coaches because we know that coaches influence uh, have more influence on kids than probably 
pastors do. Probably more than their daddy does. So they spend a lot of time. I'm also a coach. I coach at Harvester Christian Academy in Douglasville. And it's very impactful. We also know that the school, the, the, uh, the student body in the school, who do they look up to? The athletes. So it's kind of like a trickle-down effect. So our first approach, trying to get FCA started back up, because FCA died and went away. There was none. Zero. All right, we're going to start with the coaches. So we went into Alexander High School, and it's hard. As what he talked about, it is hard starting it from scratch. I have been doing this now in Douglas County for three years, and I'm still not in every school. I'm almost. But it's hard. And then you gotta, you got you to gotta get you some soldiers to help you run this stuff. Um, so this is, uh, you can, th um, this is actually a little bit old because the FCA has been around now for 60 year, 61 years. And if you look right there, this says 52,275 lives were transformed through FCA camp alone. Last year in the country, 300,000 students were reached on a record 7,916 school campuses across America. So that's pretty amazing. 8,000 campuses? So um, you can hit the next screen. And this is a quote from Billy Graham, a coach will impact more people in a year than most people will in a lifetime. Right. Straight from Billy Graham. Um, and you can hit the next, uh, next, next, right there. All right, back one. They have these, what we call the four C's of ministry, and we got these campus, coaches, camps, and community. We here in Douglas County are hitting all four of these. A campus would be a school. A coach is going to be a coach within a school. A camp's going to be what uh, occurs over the summertime. Douglas County is involved in three camps. Football camp at West Georgia in July. Leadership camp at St. Simons in the end of June, beginning of July. And a coaches camp. Those are the three that we're involved in. There's camps all over, but those are the three we choose to partner with Cobb, Paulding, and all the surrounding metro Atlanta areas. Those are the three we get involved in. And now we also have community. We even have ra uh, tra travel and rec teams that are involved with FCA. Um, they, you know, her, our, her daughter, my stepdaughter, is involved on a travel softball team. I'm trying to get out of everybody's way. On a travel softball team, you can hit next, and they're even a certified huddle. A huddle, in FCA terminology, this would be a huddle in FCA terminology. And you could have uh, a, a coach's huddle. You could have a teacher, teacher huddle, school-wide Bible study huddle, team football huddle, student huddle, leadership huddle. It's just whatever, whatever it is. We have 55 of these now in the county. That's pretty amazing. A weekly. We have 55 huddles. Now, sometimes they're seasonal because the sport will end and they don't pick back up, but some of those sports will continue to meet as a FCA huddle, even though their they're sport's not in season, it's not in session. We're reaching right now on average about 2,110 students a week, students and athletes. There's churches that don't even come close to reaching 2,100. I don't think, there's probably not even one in this county. Um, this is uh, what our huddle started off with at Alexander High School. Me, a coach, and those two kids. That's what it started off with two and a half years ago. That was about, mm, probably about six months after we started it. Had about 50 kids. That's what it is right now for the last two years, every single Friday morning. I mean, there's over 300 kids there, over 300 kids, so it's pretty amazing. So that's what we would call a campus student huddle. Um, this is uh, team football, that's at Alexander High School. Uh, team baseball, that's Alexander High School. This is a coach's Bible study. Uh, we have a coach's Bible study at every single high school, all, uh, every day of the week in every high school. And we're in five of the eight middle schools. It's just those are ran with by the coaches. 
So it's pretty amazing to see how coaches can start a, um, a, a monster thing. If you look and see one of these coaches, and the coach will say, well, I can't pray with the team because I get that, that, that separation of church and state, but I can come over here and pray by myself. And then you see next thing you know, you see other coaches just joining. Uh, hit next. That's another coach's study right there. This is uh, at football camp. You can't really uh, grasp the, the nature of that entire situation, but just try to put yourself in this situation and see 54 high school football teams, 3,200 athletes, 700 decisions for Christ. One of them's a coach and the kids praying for each other. You will cry your eyeballs out July 19th if you want to come down there and see this. Alexander High School will be there that session. That's at football camp. Every camp has got uh, uh, spiritual, spiritual stuff alongside it. This is leadership camp down in St. Simons. There's always four to what, four to 500 kids. That's at the leadership camp as well. And I'm just trying to give you all some ideas of how this, these camps take place. It's not just in the school. They take it elsewhere. You know, it's just like church ain't just on Sundays. Right? right? Uh, back it up one, two. There's a, her daughter's softball team. Now, that was about a year ago. But there's, you know, just a community, not even any involved with the school, a community travel softball team doing prayer. Um, and a lot of times they'll do it with the other team as well. Next, and that's us down in Panama City. Had a guy um, ask me to come down there and perform the wedding ceremony for him and his bride-to-be and then share with the team. This right here is uh, a numbers deal right here. We have 55 huddles in the county, reaching 2,110 coaches, athletes, and students. Um, I don't have the stat for this year yet because the summer hasn't happened yet, so I gave you the stat from last summer. 186 coaches, athletes, and students attending camp. And it's not cheap. You know, so that was about $32,000 to send 186 to camp. Um, last year, we had 293 decisions in the county at local schools. I distributed 477 Bibles. This year alone, we've already distributed, I think, 800 Bibles. Um, we fed about 2,500 coaches, athletes, and students, and, um, you know, we probably, we probably buy anywhere from 500 to 1,000 biscuits a week that go out from um, Chick-fil-A, that go out to our student huddles to help feed them. And uh, right now, we have 14 church partnerships. Church on the Word is one of, the, one of those 14, and we actually have six board members now, so that's actually went down by one. Um, you can hit next. This is kind of where we stand in the county. I mean, if you look, we got eight middle schools. We're in six of those eight. We're in all five high schools. We're in all four private schools, and we, got, we actually have now seven Seven community. I just haven't updated that. And, the, and another thing is I just got a call from West Georgia Central. They want to huddle there at the college and CCI. We have the opportunity to reach, I'm not sure if you all can see that from back there, 30,000 students just in the public school system alone. That doesn't include the private. So 30,000 students, we're reaching 2,000. Now that number, 2,110, is huge for a week. But look at the potential that we have for growth. Next. That's just a growth chart just to show where we, where we stood two and a half years ago when we started with zero. And now where we are now, uh, 55 huddles. Next. And this will be the last slide. And I'll close out and let Pastor John come uh, close us out. That's just a key legend chart. Kind of shows it's color coded to kind of tell you what kind of huddle it is and where it's located and what school within the county of Douglas County. Pretty amazing stuff, wouldn't you say? Hey, I wanted to, uh, again, say thank you guys for, for inviting me out. I do have some brochures and stuff out in the back if you want any of that information or any other information about FCA or how to get involved. Just let me know, and I'll be back there. Thank you, Pastor. Love you.
Why would you, why would you, Jesus said, don't do this one thing and leave the other undone. Let's not be so foreign mission minded that we forget what's going on right under our noses. So I'm going to ask you to do this. I'm going to ask you to partner with Dutch Nelson personally. The way to do that is ask the Lord what he would have you to do. I want to receive an offering for him today, but I also want you to, let's, um, how can we do this where we can receive an offering for him? Let's uh, make that offering payable to Church on the Word. We'll give him a, a single check for today's offering. But then I want those of you to pray and ask the Lord what he would have you to do concerning this man's income. He needs, this is for his not, this is for his personal income. He still has to eat. He still has to pay a mortgage. He still has to pay utilities. He still needs to, he's got a wife. Need I say more? <clears throat> the man needs, and, and the thing is, and it's, he's, it's, he's found a good thing and, found, and obtained favor of the Lord. I want you to consider adding him to your list of missionaries that you support. I know a lot of y'all support personal missions. Some of you can support him $10 a month. Others of you can support him $1,000 a month. I want you to support him some way every month, and I want you to do that with him personally. I don't want you to do that through Church on the Word. I want him to have your name, address, your um your uh, email address, your phone number. I want you to be able to interact with him. I want you to go out and go to a huddle one morning and uh, see what goes on. Let him see that this today this is just theory. I want you to see it and live it, the experience of that huddle. And uh, Because here's the thing, y'all. Just two and a half years ago, this wasn't going on. And here in just a few years, very few years, I've got grandkids that are going to be going into these high schools. I'd much rather there to be a strong fellowship of Christian athletes and with prayer-minded and study-minded and Bible-minded people from the principal right on down to the, to the newest student in those schools before my grandkids get there, wouldn't you? Amen. Yeah, and, and the parents said amen. <clears throat> you, got, you got partner cards in the back? In the back. Uh, why don't you go out and grab his partner cards and, and bring those in right quick. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do we extract the information from the people today so that you can go away from here with email addresses and everything? Okay, go ahead. And, uh, do you want to do that? I think we ought to bring those in and give the cards to the people, don't you think? Okay. Let's get the cards to the people quicker. You got them? Okay. Come on up, gentlemen. I'm just thankful. I'm so thankful. This is the prayers of the saints for a lot of years here in this county. This place has been messed up. If you knew the methamphetamines, there was a time that the biggest dope dealer was kin to one of the biggest uh, officials in our county. And you get, you get big in the county, you get to thinking you're above the law, and if your kid gets caught, you get him out of it, and he still goes out and deals dope, and you're supposed to be hired, you're, you're elected by the people to protect the county, and your own son is, is destroying the kids of the county? My God. That's all I'll say about that. That's over with. But that happened. All right, let's bring those cards in here. You ready? Come on, gentlemen. Uh, what are they doing out there? Can you check, make sure why we're not getting cards in for the people? <clears throat> It's not time to fellowship. Come on. Give me a report. Come on. There we go. Come on. All right, gentlemen, if you make sure everybody gets the cards. Okay. Make sure out they get everything. Okay. Start passing them out. Good deal. Information's inside the brochure. You'll have a business card. Everybody get one? <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Do we have a... Um, is, has my keyboard player departed the building? All right, then you can uh, do something for me in that regard then, can't you? Very good. I believe in outreach. I, th I consider this in reach. Reaching our kids right here. I love it. All right. Now, if you have a church on the word 
offering envelope, I want you to make a check payable to Church on the Word and just put on your memo, Dutch Nelson, and we'll see to it. He gets everything, including an honoraria that we have set aside. Raise your hand. Make sure everybody gets an envelope. Just make sure everybody gets a church envelope. Everyone. Are we out of church envelopes? <clears throat> All right, let's get every, let's get make sure we got everybody gets a church envelope. <clears throat> okay. All right. We're going to take care of our own. Our kids are going to do better than they've ever done. I believe Douglas County will be the, the light of Atlanta, not just be known for its methamphetamines and known for its crack cocaine and known for its drug addictions and known for its kids that are in, in trouble and like it's been in the past where you have to, get a, have to sign in or, or elect a get tough sheriff that just thinks that you're just, and I, that's the only thing you can do is just throw them in jail and make life as hard as you, and then they come out harder than what they were when they went in. No. We're not going to have a county like that. Our county is going to have a, a get-tough program on, on, the, on the crime, but we're also going to have the best county in all of metro Atlanta. It'll be the model for what to do. voice nothing changes you can pray all you want to but until somebody preaches till somebody has a passion till somebody can can say with their mouth what jesus did for them nobody comes it's the preaching of the gospel that does it can you see how the kids would listen to someone like him and i'll tell you one like him the local school dope dealer ain't going to get one over on him he'll see him it takes a it takes a con to read a con, they say. And that local dope dealer in the school is not going to be able to fool him. That's why you got to have one like him. And I'll tell you, before, uh, before Dutch leaves, bring him back in. We're going to pray over him right quick. He's having that esophageal thing. that He's having that struggle inside his, uh, uh, his digestive tract. We prayed over him last night, but I want your faith for him. We've got to keep him preaching. We've got to keep him healthy. <clears throat> Is, make sure Shay's with you, Dutch. <clears throat> Everybody ready? You know what the Lord wants you to do? Come on up here, Jane Lee. Okay. No. So it's going to be a long day. We're going to leave from here. We're going to throw something together to eat right quick and go see Reinhardt Bonnke, but it will slow down. And then Janie's on jury duty. While, uh, while we're waiting on Shay, let me just make this quick announcement. For the first time since 2004, finally this morning, Nancy Reagan got to dance with Ronald again just this morning. <laughs> Isn't that precious? Hey, buddy. Come here. Come here, you. Come right here. Stretch your hand out here towards him. God, thank you for sending somebody to my county, to my kids. That's been there. It's not going to be be fooled by some con artist, dope dealer. He smell him before he sees him. Thank you for the favor that he's got with our officials, the favor that he's got with our incoming sheriff, whoever that may be, the favor that he's got with our principals, whoever they are, the favor that he has with our elected officials, the favor that he has with pastors. Lord, I'm asking you to alert the hearts and the eyes and the ears of the pastors to see what's going on and send our churches to help him, to reach our kids in our counties, <clears throat> our county schools. 
from elementary to middle to high school and into the colleges. God, it's been said that we can't have Bibles in our schools because those, those schools are funded by state dollars. Well, would somebody please tell me why it is we can have Bibles in our prisons? Those are funded by state dollars too. Sounds to me like if you can have a Bible in the state prison, you ought to be able to have one in the high school and teach it like a class. <clears throat> I believe that Bible study <laughs> will return like it did when I was in high school, where it's Bible as literature to start with, and then teach them God's Word and tell them about Jesus. There's nothing wrong with that. There may be, as they say, a separation of church and state, but there is not a separation between faith and the people that the county is to minister to. Now, we pray for his healing. Stretch your hand towards him. Healing. Now, whatever's going on in his digestive tract, now, you behave yourself. Amen. And he'll be able to eat his food and drink and, be, and flow and his body function normally. I say blood pressure is 120 over 70. Respirations are perfect. Oxygen, 100%. Every organ functioning like it ought to function in Jesus' name. Now, I understand you had a little bout with a little C word earlier in the year. Is that true? Yeah. What? The radiation now. The radiation right now. Stretch your hand out here towards her. Cancer, come out of her in the name of Jesus. One hundred percent health and wholeness for the entire Nelson family. I'll tell you this, there's an old song that was sung years ago said that sometimes I just need to sit down and rest a while because the soldier's still a child. He's a soldier, but he's a child, y'all. Can you see his childlike ways? Can you see him? He's not, he's not bashful about it. Just let you see his childlike. I pray he don't lose it. But he keeps those childlike ways. So the kids see him, they, they, rec they, they can empathize with, he can empathize with them and they, they can agree with him. They see, man, he's like one of us. God, give him God's word, give him your word in the Bible, teach him. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Romans, Acts, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, teach him the New Testament, teach him the, my son, be strong in the grace that is in you. And the things which you've heard of me among many witnesses, the same you'll be able to commit to faithful men who are able to teach others also. <laughs> Sometimes you say these things by the Spirit and they flow right out of you. That's what's going to happen for you. Now, God, he needs $10,000 a month to fund everything he's doing and plus everything that he's just, I know how he is. He take up his own salary and make sure the kids have biscuits in the morning. Now, I know what the heart of the shepherd is. I know what he does. Isn't that what he does? I know what he does. I'm asking you to give us the ability, increase our income to double up on him. And we pray for all of our students in Douglas County that his mouth is connected to their heart. And we'll see revival. So much so that this place will be a place of light and victory. In Jesus' name. Okay. Y'all can go to your table. Okay, brother. Y'all give these guys a hand as they go to their table. <clears throat> all right gentlemen father i receive the offerings of the people i thank you sir for its abundance in jesus name gentlemen and while they're receiving his offering i want to thank you all that are by live stream joining us for the word wise christian broadcast here at church on the word Remember, God sent us his written word to get our thinking straightened out. When his mindset becomes our own, that's when peace settles in, our thinking and our confession gets straightened out. 
our life gets straightened out then because we have become word wise. God bless you. See you next week. Yeah, amen. All right, Jay Alexander.